Good evening. You're on Law Line. You have a question for us? Yes. Yes, I do. I had my first blood test to examine my cobalt chromium levels, and I received the results last week. My cobalt levels were 4.7, and my chromium levels were 2.2 parts per billion. Could you explain what this means? Sure. I'll take that first, and Daniel can follow up on it. The uh, caller, in case you didn't hear the call, was referring to the blood tests that are ordered by the physicians, which, by the way, now, the letters that you're getting from the doctors or from the Broadspire or Stryker, some of them saying directly, recommend that you go in for a clinical examination uh, if you had one of these defective or recalled implants. And among the things that they're recommending during the clinical exam is blood to be drawn and uh, tests to be done to see whether or not there are ions circulating in your bloodstream to the two main metals in these devices that we showed you. Uh, when these devices break down, when the corrosion occurs, uh, the body's uh, natural forces cause this uh, the tiny particulate debris, this metallic debris, to be ionized and distributed throughout your bloodstream. And what shows up typically are high levels of cobalt and chromium. There's a third element that's, that's really not relevant because it's in such a small amount in the implants. But uh, chromium and cobalt in particular can be toxic, especially cobalt. In this example, the caller has said 4.7 and 2.2 or so of uh, chromium, 4.7 of cobalt. Uh, that's concerning. There shouldn't be measurable quantities on a, on a consistent basis of cobalt in particular in your bloodstream. Now, the defendants will say that we get cobalt in food and in vitamins, nutritional supplements, as well as some trace levels of chromium. They'll also say that the chromium present in these devices is of a type that's not toxic, but no one has any real certainty with that yet. In fact, they're all calling for studies to be done to see what the long-term consequences of these levels of chromium and cobalt. But everyone pretty much agrees that if you have over four or five parts per billion of cobalt showing up and that test is followed up and it's consistent or it's, it's getting larger, then that is a potential problem. Um, what, what we see beyond that, and Daniel can talk a little bit about this, is what actually happens in the tissue consistently with these people who have the elevated blood levels. You want to talk about metallosis? Right, absolutely. Well, with those kind of levels, the you know they're they're kind of in what we call the borderline category. So if it's somewhere between a one and a seven, you're in this borderline. And certainly having the 4.7 for cobalt's concerning. And and another part of this whole equation is going to be since this is your first blood test, uh, you know where there's probably going to need to be another one some down the road, six months or a year from there. You know, preferably six months. But uh, certainly listen to what your doctor has to say about that. But with that kind of a level, uh, we usually like to see some other kind of imaging uh, study that's going to look at the hip area itself. So either an ultrasound or what's known as a Mars MRI, which is a special diagnostic tool where they can look to see joint fluid buildup, uh, see some of the tissue damage that's, being, that's occurring. And essentially with these, with this metallosis, these metal ions get out into the body. We're not going to talk as much about what happens when they get in the bloodstream and go everywhere else. Uh, there's certainly you know, some different differences in the sciences as far as, you know, what kind of damage you have from these kind of levels being in the bloodstream. But we're going to talk about specifically mm -hmm. right around the hip, uh, what we're seeing people who have levels comparative to this, when they have a revision surgery, they can have all sorts of necrotic tissue, uh, blackened, dead dying tissue, uh, joint fluid buildup and the joint fluids discolored, uh, even pockets of fluid throughout the uh, tissue itself so that when they're opened up, they, they may even spray. Uh, you know, certainly a lot of issues that are, are concerning, and the longer that it goes on, the, the higher your chances are of having more and more complications, and uh, without following, it up on a, following up on it appropriately, uh, it could make it difficult for any future revision uh, to be a success. So it's important to make sure you continue to follow up with those diagnostic studies and follow up with your doctor. Very good points, Daniel. And, you know, it's, it's critical that you follow up on this letter and follow up if you're having any symptoms particularly groin pain. Um, groin pain seems to be one of the characteristic hallmarks of uh, a large amount of metallic debris and this kind of damage to the tissue that Daniel's talking about. And there's a lot of studies coming out, a lot of doctors suggesting that if you're having that kind of groin pain, you shouldn't be um, absent, you know, some kind of acute trauma. You shouldn't have, after several weeks and you've recuperated from surgery, you shouldn't be having severe groin pain, back pain, thigh pain, buttocks pain. And if you are, uh, then, then it's better to go in sooner rather than later so the doctor can evaluate you clinically and the doctor can determine, you know, are the cobalt levels elevated? 
is there radiographic you know imaging studies evidence of loosening of the prosthesis and am i going to save this patient you know needless heartache and long-term severe trouble by going ahead and revising uh, the hip implant sooner rather than later obviously that's a medical decision we can't tell you you know when and if you should get your hip implant out but um, the doctors you know, have come a long way over the last couple of years with all these metal on metal hip implants that have been evaluated by the uh, FDA. And there's a growing consensus that if you let this dying tissue Daniel was talking about continue to be uh, uh, exposed to all these levels of metallic debris, that, that, that you may be doing yourself a lot more damage in the long run. And many doctors think if you have that evidence, if you're having pain, if you're having any radiographic evidence of loosening, if you're having high cobalt levels, especially if it gets up over 10. We have clients who have cobalt over 100 until they get the implant removed. When they get it removed, it goes back down to normal levels. And the thinking a lot of these doctors is, why let it climb from 10 to 100? If it's 10 already and you have any abnormal pain, go ahead and take it out before it gets worse. Did that answer your question, caller? It does. All right, thank you for your call. We appreciate it.